Okay, well, welcome everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Natalia Dotto and I work with Rebel 11 co-founders, Joni Parsons and Monica Smith. Joni and Monica started this Rebel 11 platform five years ago as a way to present fun, edgy and informative events for women. And the Rebel 11 community is now more than 6,000 women worldwide. And we truly believe that women are better together and together we will change the world. So we're so glad you are with us. And today I'm so thrilled to introduce Karen Walrund. Karen is an author, a lawyer, a leadership coach, an activist. She's a certified Dare to Lead facilitator and she has helped thousands of people around the world find purpose and meaning in their work. As a photographer, Karen has traveled throughout Africa with the One Campaign and serves on the board for the Houston Coalition Against Hate. Karen, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, tell us a little bit more. I mean, that was a brief intro. You've done so much. Tell us a little yeah. bit more about yourself. Oh, yeah, it's lovely to be here. Thank you all for coming. Trinidadians, thank you for representing. <laughs> I'm extremely excited about that. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm originally obviously from the Caribbean from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I have a, I think I, I think I saw one classmate from my high school um, it, up there already. Uh, I moved to the United States the last time. I moved a lot back and forth a lot um, when I was a child, and I moved to Texas actually um, in my senior year of high school, and then um, ended up going to university in Texas, to Texas A&M University, got an engineering degree, was an engineer for a while, went to law school, did a, was a lawyer for a long time, moved to London, that's what we were just talking about, moved to London, um, picked up a souvenir in the form of my husband, who is a Brit, <laughs> and brought him back to Texas, um, where we adopted our daughter, who is our um, token American in our family. And, um, and yeah, so I've been doing that for a long time. I. Uh, I was a lawyer for many years, still am a lawyer. I don't practice anymore, but um, still am, a, you know, I still am licensed with the, state, with the state of Texas. And since then I wrote a book called um, The Beauty of Different. Uh, I wrote that about 10 years ago about how the thing that makes you different is what makes you beautiful and probably the source of, source of your um, superpowers. And uh, all through that, I was a lawyer and then I was a writer and then I became um, a, a, a leadership coach. And now actually I spend a large portion of my day working with Brene Brown, who is a, um, if you're not familiar with her, a lot of people already are, but she is a researcher here in Houston. And I work with his, her organization handling the global side of her business. Um, and I've done a lot of activist work. And as Nat, Natalia mentioned, I'm on the board of the Houston Coalition Against Hate. So activism is part of the reason I think, I think it was, um, Martin Luther King, I can't remember if it, I may be misquoting him about activism and giving back is sort of how we pay rent here on, on this earth. And I really do believe that. And so my latest book is called The Lightmaker's Manifesto. It came out at the end of last year and it's about how to make change in the world while holding on to your joy. So this, yeah, this is the book. So if you yes. haven't seen it, it's um, The Lightmaker's Manifesto, how to work for change without losing your joy. and. As you can see, I mean, I love this book because it's you've broken it down into little segments that are super digestible and there's so much information packed in each one. Um, just tell us a little bit about what brought about this book. Um, yeah, and, so I, yeah. I would love to say that it was a book that was just crying to get out of me and that, uh, you know, I had this muse inside of me that was crying for this. But the truth of the matter is that I, um, my publisher, who was not my publisher at the time, they approached me and um, they had been basically, they had, they had read my work. They had read some, some work that I had contributed to a, um, to a anthology in the past. And they'd signed up for my newsletter and she emailed me out of the blue. It was actually, let me make sure I get this right. It was January 2nd, 2020 when I got this email and the email said, hey, we love your writing. We are looking for a book on the intersection of joy and activism. And we think you're the ones who could write this. Um, and I had chosen for my word of the year or my words of the year for 2020, bold and experiment, which was the only reason I didn't delete her email. So I said, well, okay, let's let's meet. And, I, and she said, do you think you could do this? And I said, oh, absolutely. I'll put together a proposal, it'll be fine. 
hung up the phone or hung up the Zoom, I guess, and said, I, I am totally not qualified to do this. I thought, I don't know why I said yes, this is crazy. Um, I'm not an activist. I've never thought of myself as an activist. And so I sat down and I thought, well, in my first book, The Beauty of Different, I interviewed a lot of people and I really loved the process of interviewing people. So I thought, well, let me think, who do I know who are activists? Um, and maybe I'll interview them. So the first person I thought of was Brene. Um, and I, so I wrote her name down. And Tarana Burke was another friend of mine who founded the Me Too movement. And I wrote her name down. I came up with this list. And in my mind, I think an activist was somebody who gets tear gassed or somebody who gets arrested or, you know, have police dogs set on them, right? Like those are activists, hunger strikes. Um, so that's why I couldn't be an activist. But then when I looked at my list, I realized, well, none of these people are, as far as I know, getting arrested on the regular or, um, you know, getting tear gas. So what makes it okay for me to call them activists, but not call myself an activist? And really, that's where the book came from. It was sort of an exploration about what is it that makes an activist? What does that mean? Um, and, uh, and how can we do it in a way that isn't draining? Right, because your book sort of reframes that, um, mm -hmm. what it means to be an activist. And I, I just do find it interesting that that you took so long to consider yourself an activist. Yeah. And yeah, well, I, I mean, yeah. Go ahead, go sorry, ahead. yeah. <laughs> no. I think, you know, it's funny because people who have since read the book have, I've gotten many, many emails going, oh my gosh, I think I might be an activist. Like I never thought about that. I think it's really hard I, in a lot of ways for us to think of ourselves as activists. And I'm not, even having written the book, I'm not entirely sure why that is. You know, you, you know like I think, I think some of it has to do with the same sort of mindset that I had, that it requires a certain level of personal physical peril to be consider yourself an activist. I think that's one. I think also um, there's a little bit, of, people don't want to, there's an ego maybe thing to, you know, like it'd be like calling myself a humanitarian or something like, you know, or a, an icon. Like, you know, I think some people also think that it would be very weird to call yourself an activist um, because that's a lofty goal. I think that's part of it as well. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, the thing that I came up with is I said somebody who uses, is led by their values to work for, to make the world brighter for others. That to me is what an activist is. And once you start to think of it that way, the idea of you being an activist or all of us being activists or the potential for all of us to be activists starts to open up. Yeah, and in your in the book, you quote um, Edith Wharton and say there are two ways of spreading light: be the candle or the mirror that reflects it. But in the book, you say there's a third way. And so, can you? And that's the, basically the crux of the book is mm. um, you're, the third way that you're talking about. Can you explain it and what it yeah. means to you? Yeah. So that I love that quote of Edith Wharton. I love the idea that you know you can be the candle. And in my mind, at the time, that being the candle was sort of being kind, right? Like that's how you make light. You, you're, you're kinder to, or that you are light. You, you're kind to people and loving and which is great. Or you can reflect back people who are kind to you or pay it forward, which is also great. But I think, um, and this is where sort of the phrase make light and you can see I have it everywhere, right? Make light. I think that there's, there is, we are all called to sort of look at who we are and what our gifts are and figure out how can we use that to serve. And that's what I think is make light is. It's not just about being kind to people and it's not just paying forward kindnesses, but it's also figuring out how you can create um, some of that work yourself and doing it in a way that only you can do it because of your own skills and innate talents and gifts and the things that light you up. Yeah, and, and also the activism that you do doesn't have to be a daily thing. It's it's right. something that you feel that you can do um, throughout your day or throughout, whether it's once a, once a month or once a year or something like that. So, yeah. um, Absolutely. And I, I think that's also the other reason that a lot of people are nervous about getting into activism is because they think, well, I got a job, right? Like I, you know, I would love to go and save the world, Karen, but I've got bills to pay, right? Like I've got a family to raise or, um, 
and yeah, for sure, it should. I don't think it has to be an all or nothing thing. I think um, some of the biggest activists I know have, I mean, some of them have made it their full-time job to be an activist, that's for sure. And there are people in the book who I've interviewed who have done that. But many, if not most people, it's it can be a side hustle. It can be something that they do as an avocation, sort of a hobby. Um, it can be something that, uh, it can be very seasonal. Um, if you think of like people like who are um, a, fr a very good friend of mine who's actually in the book, Asha Dornfest, she does a lot on, around getting out the vote. And so there's sort of a, a seasonal um, way that she's very active, you know, when it's, we're starting to get um, closer and closer to elections and, and primary, she tends to be very busy. And then after an election, she tends to be quiet. So there's, um, there's all different ways that we can be activists for sure. Yeah. You, and so in the book, you interviewed a, a number of people, Brene Brown, mm -hmm. you mentioned Tarana Book, who founded um, the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. um, and you, so you, and friends um, that you, you talked to about their activism. Yeah. So what was one thing they all had in common? And was there, and what, and what were the things that stuck out about their journeys and what they did? So, yes. So there were, um, the, the people that I interviewed were, people who did everything from, uh, they were faith leaders um, and they found their activism as part of their faith. There were people who were, um, you know, sort of feminist and sort of for women and girls' rights. There were people who were about kids. There were people who were about um, people who were previously incarcerated. There were all these different um, things that people had become very passionate about. And so what they had in common um, all of them, and I think this is really, and I hadn't thought about this actually until right this minute that you asked this question, even though I knew the question was coming. Um, all of them are doing something that is innate to who they are, um, is, is something that they couldn't not do, right? Um, and I think a lot of times when we think I should give back or I should do something. Like there's a lot of should that's involved in that, which is good. Like you, you need that should to help motivate you. But sometimes you it may propel you into a part of activism that's really not who you are. Or um, here's here's a, like for an ex, ex, as an example, um, let's talk about food deserts, for example. Like that that's like people who don't have enough food and communities that don't have a lot of food in them. Um, I can read an article about that and I could think yeah, that's wrong, that that's, people should be able to access food. But if it's not something around which I have a real passion about, I would probably do something for a little while and then I'll burn out, right? But then the, for me, like for example, anti-discrimination is something that's really just drives me bananas, right? Like that's, that's a fire that's inside of me. And so it is much more likely that I'll have longevity in the work that I do because it taps into something that really sort of gets me personally. And so I would say that that's one thing that they all have in common is whatever it was that they, they do, it's something that they're in it for the long haul, right? This, and, and, and it doesn't take, I mean, I don't want to say it doesn't take anything out of them. Of course it takes it out of them because activism is very difficult, but the idea of not doing what they do would never enter their minds. They may rest from it. Sometimes you have to rest from it. I think part of good activism requires that, um, but they're going to go back in. So that's one thing for sure um, that they have in common. The other thing I think is um, they have a really heightened sense of, of intuition um, that they sort of, listen to an inner wisdom that they have as to where to go next and what to do. Um, and that's true of all of them, whether or not they were faith leaders or in some cases um, agnostic or atheist, right? Like there's, they, they had some way to tap into their, their own inner wisdom to figure out what should be next and being able to sort of drown out what's outside and what the, some of those shoulds, right? That, um, that don't make sense for them. Right. And then, yeah. And some of them you had mentioned got called into activism by a whisper or a band. Yeah. 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 yeah so. That was really interesting. And what was, that was something that was very funny or very not funny, haha, funny, odd was 
I interviewed probably a dozen people for this book and that whisper bang, and th none of these people knew each other, by the way, I don't think any of them knew each other actually. Um, that whisper bang part was, they used that language a lot. Like I kept hearing, you have to listen to the whisper or, you know, it, it came out, you know, of the blue, like a bang. And so um, Jess Weiner, who is a friend, dear friend of mine, and she does a lot of work uh, for women and girls. As a matter of fact, um, it is her business. And if you've ever seen anything in the world recently that any product that has become rather feminist, um, she probably has something to do with it. So an example would be the Dove campaign for real beauty. She was the consultant behind Dove to making that happen. Or the fact that Barbie now has different body sizes. Jess was involved in that. So, um, so that is really her passion. And she was the one that sort of first used that whisper bang analogy. And she says that there are two ways that some people can be called into activism. And one is as a bang, something really traumatic or difficult happens. Um, in her case, she was uh, sexually assaulted on campus. And that was enough for her to go, this can't happen anymore. And so um, that's what started her, her journey into activism. For some people, it's just a whisper. And I think probably for most of us, it's that way where maybe it hasn't personally happened to us, but you're seeing the news or you're, um, you're hearing about something, reading an article and something in, in the back of your head is going, I should do something about this. I, there's something here I should do something about. It. And it just won't let you go, right? Like it just won't let you go. And so um, I think it's important to think of, look at both, right? Like what is it that's just, I, I can't let that go. At, or if something really awful has happened to you or somebody you love, you go, okay, well, what can I do to change? Another friend of mine who I, um, who I interviewed who, uh, Stephanie Whittles Wax, her brother died of um, an opioid overdose. And that was one of her calls to action was that couldn't happen again. Her Both her children actually, even though she's hearing um, and her husband's hearing, they were both born deaf. And so she became a really big advocate um, for people who can't hear and how you can start making ear like um, hearing aids more accessible to children and that kind of thing. So sometimes it's a bang, but sometimes it's just the little, little whisper um, that's in the back of your head. Yeah, um, and there are so many, um, so many things that, that are on the table right now, right? The, mm. the last couple of years have been really difficult because of the pandemic, but also there have been so many social issues, um, mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter, racial injustice, climate justice, uh, the Me Too movement. I mean, it's so it's so much of it is heavy, and mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a there's a question in the chat too. It, it, there's so much to feel sad, angry, disillusioned about. Mm -hmm. It's hard to stay connected to my joy while working for change. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's what the crux of your book is about yeah. finding the joy in activism. And but how do you do that with such heavy, heavy topics? Yeah, um, I love this question. I get this question a lot. And uh, I will just, you know, for personal note, I will tell you, so I, I mentioned that this, this uh, decision to write this book wasn't mine or the choice to write the book wasn't really mine. It came from my publisher. And I signed the deal for this book like March of 2020, right? So, I mean, if we think about it, March of 2020 is when we started locking down and then George Floyd and then Breonna Taylor. And I, so I was literally writing a book about joy in a time that the whole world was literally on fire. And I remember my publisher called me one day and she said, I think I owe you an apology for <laughs> making you write this book. It's such a crazy, crazy time. Um, and you know, for me, I told her, I said, you know, it's actually a gift to write it because I am interviewing all these amazing people. And so I read a headline and then I interview somebody who's doing just amazing, wonderful work and it's very, very hopeful. So, um, so actually it, it was a gift and I'm not sure that I would have dealt with 2020 as well as I did, except for the fact that I was, I was doing that. So there's probably some wisdom in that as far as how to keep your joy um, that I'll let you guys sort of glean. So that's that, but the book, what the book talks about and what, what I think is sort of the overarching thing about the book is the way that you keep your joy, one, is it needs to be, you need to be very, very clear about what it is, what is your passion or your, your cause going to be, um, and, then, and then stick with it. 
Because what of course happens is you think, okay, I'm gonna do anti-discrimination work. And then you find out that some huge company is polluting. And so you're like, well, should I be looking at environmental stuff, right? And and it can, so you have to be very, very clear. What is it that I'm gonna move and trust that for somebody else, that environmental cause is their, is their cause, right? So be very clear on that. Um, the second thing is, understand that your activism is going in order for there to be longevity in your activism right is it needs to be something that is i don't want to say fun for you to do because let's face it we don't we don't get enter into activism because it's we're happy right like we don't enter into it because everything's great something has either broken our heart or pissed us off um but something like if for example i'm a photographer i love photography um photography is the source of a lot of my joy and so for me if I can use my photography to help advance the cause then being tapping into that thing that I would do no matter what helps me to maintain my joy because I'm using and doing that that skill and that talent and that gift and so you have to be very clear about what is it that thing that you can do and think about how can I that can be of service so that's the second thing the third thing is um Community is really, really big, like being able to um, have people that you can work with, um, have friends around you, what I call your star collective, people who can help you um, process when things get difficult, but also can help give you advice, can help share somebody you can talk through. And the fourth thing, and I think this is the one I, I put it last, but it might really actually be first as far as importance, is, is resting right? Like really pulling back and resting and, and not um, pushing yourself to the point of exhaustion. And um, Valerie Kaur, who is a faith leader and a civil rights activist and a civil rights lawyer and a filmmaker and all of these crazy, amazing things. She's wonderful. Um, she, and she wrote a great book called, by the way, See, See No Stranger. So I'm going to do a, put a little plug in for that. She's an amazing woman. There's a lot of, um, anti-immigration, big, like bigotry against immigrants and that kind of thing. And when I interviewed her, she said something that was both really um, depressing, but also very freeing at the same time. And she said, you know, we are never going to get to the point where we, everything is fine. Like when we enter into activism, we are never going to get to the point where everybody is free, where the environment is fully clean, where we're never going to get there which is depressing. And she said, but, so the goal is to be able to take the baton from the people who come, who come from us and then have longevity in the work so that we can pass the baton on later. And the way that we do that is we listen to the rhythms and we get into the rhythm. So we understand that sometimes we push and she uses a beautiful metaphor of the midwife, right? Um, that the midwife doesn't say push, 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 push. And the midwife doesn't say, just breathe, don't push, just breathe, right? It's an ebb, it's breathe and then push, breathe and then push. And so that rest is not just about, you know, put your own oxygen mask on, you know, so that you can help other people, which is a, a fair statement, but it's also about how do you inhale to gather the energy in again, recover, and then you push again, and really sort of understanding that ebb and flow. Um, and that's really how you get the longevity in the work and how you continue to tap into joy. Um, and, you know, there's other things like sometimes you have to take a media diet, right? Because sometimes your head's doing crazy stuff. Sometimes you just have to um, to just be able to um, let somebody else take it for a little while um, while you take a rest before you come back in. So really sort of understanding that rhythm and what does the rhythm calling you to do in any given moment is a lot of the ways we do it. Yeah, and Allison says um, about the metaphor, Allison and Natalie say it's a great metaphor. So it's lovely, it's, isn't it? I yeah. wish I could say it was mine, but uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> but it, it, it's 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 Valerie's and it's such a great idea. And I I had never I will say I had never really thought of rest as anything but for recovery before talking with um, these. And they said, it, no, it's about also gathering the energy, right? Like it's also, it's yeah. not just the recovery, but also being able to gather the energy to go back in again, which I love. 
Well, and something else that's kind of surprising that you um, wrote about in the book is failure along the journey. Um, mm, that's always and, fun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it happens. So um, can you explain a little more about that? Yeah. I mean, you know, so yeah, there's, there is going to be failure. There's going to be times when the bill that you want um, passed won't get passed or the, um, the criminal trial won't go the way that you want or whatever, right? And so there's definitely going to be that. Um, there's also, for example, the times, and I think this is especially true for those of us who are advocating, advocating for a community of which we are not a member. So think of like allyship, right? Um, if I'm doing something, for example, like I'm, I'm a straight woman, right? And if I decide that my part of my, what I'm going to be doing is for the LGBTQ plus com, um, community, that I'm going to say something wrong or do something wrong. And I think also, by the way, that's another reason why people don't get into activism is because of that fear. What if I screw up? What if I fail? Right? Um, and so it's going to happen as as my friend Brene will always say, the, the moment that you decide to dare greatly means that you're going to fail. Like it's not, you're gonna risk failure. Like at some point you're gonna fall. Um, and the, the thing that I think we have to cultivate in all of this is a sort of resilience, is an, is an ability to, first of all, especially, especially when you're advocating for a group of which you are not a member, um, is to listen, is to take um, guidance from people who have done the activism work well and understand and, and, and learn and research from them. Um, I think that's a big part. Tarana Burke, that was actually one of the biggest lessons she said was, I had to learn that my job is to look at the elders and listen to what the elders are doing in my type of activism and follow their lead and ask questions. And I think that's really, really important. Um, in the case of, let's just go race because it's an easy one for me to talk about, right? Um, if you are white and you are wanting to advocate for somebody, uh, for the, a community of color, um, look at other white people who are doing the work well, and you know are doing, and ask them the best ways to do it, right? Because you wanna be very careful not to burden the people who are suffering and say, tell me how I can do this, right? Like that can be a very, very dangerous thing to do. So, um, so really sort of looking at who does the work, reading about the work of people who are doing things well um, and learning and then taking accountability when you screw up because you're gonna screw up and commit to doing better. And I think um, for most of us, um, if you take accountability for when you've screwed up, you will get a lot of grace, right? Um, that's where the grace comes, is being able to say, I, di I, I did something wrong here. I'm trying to do better. I'm going to try to be better. And I apologize for the pain that I caused. And I think uh, for most of us, if we do that and we go in with sort of the good heart and the best of intentions and the commitment to do better, um, we'll get more grace than we expect, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I do agree with that. I mean, it's good faith effort, so. Mm. Um, uh, one of the interviews you did is with a positive psychology coach and a play evangelist, which I didn't know there were such things, but I didn't um, either. <laughs> <laughs> and he talks about the, the importance of play in being an activist, which to me is counterintuitive, but um, you write about it and it makes sense. Yeah. So that is a, a sweet friend of mine. His name is Jeff Harry. Um, and he is a play activist. And, and for a lot of his work, like sort of his main work is helping introduce play in corporate, in corporations, right? And he said, I, um, and I hope I get this right, but he basically said that he thinks play is as important as sleeping or eating or breathing. Like it's something that we need to do. And um, the, what he says is, first of all, you have to understand that play is not um, play. There's a lot of elements of play. And Stuart Brown is actually um, sort of the, 
guru on play, but um, play has elements like it, it feels like there's no point to it. Um, it feels like um, flow that you sort of lose track of time. Um, so play can look like a lot of different things. Play could be dance for somebody. It could be, it could be knitting. It could be anything else. But um, what, what Jeff says is that if you think about sort of any big invention, like um, the Wright brothers who would, a lot of what they came up with was because they were playing, right? It, there's that a lot of times innovation and creativity is born of play, right? Of sort of that tinkering and that playing kind of thing. And so, um, so having a play mindset can be very, very uh, helpful because it, if, you, if you're in flow and you're doing those things that you wanna do and you're getting creative about it, that that's really a wonderful way um, to start tapping into the joy um, with purpose, right? With meaning and purpose. Um, and by the way, that's something that we didn't talk about. Joy is distinguished from happiness because it, it does tap into meaning and purpose. It's not a fleeting, oh, somebody wished me happy birthday today. It is, I'm tapping into my own meaning and my purpose. And being able to do that through play is a beautiful way to be able to um, access your, your activism as well. Um, he also cited, uh, uh, um, gosh, I've just lost the man's name. The uh, the civil rights leader who was on somebody help me with the um, the the Pettus Edward Pettus Bridge who oh. um, recently died. John Lewis. John, John Lewis, Lewis. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> yes. Um, so there's a great story in John Lewis's um, autobiography that I cite where he talks about how part of one of their missions was to get arrested as part as civil rights and then. Um, and so that they would overwhelm the prisons, right? So there would be all these sit-ins sit and everything um, where they would have to arrest all of these black people because they were sitting and, and, and then overwhelm the prisons. And then when they did, they got in prisons, they started singing yeah. and it drove people bananas, right? And, like, and so they eventually let them go, but it was sort of a way to sing and tap into joy and tap into that kind of thing, even though it was clearly a really miserable time but it also helped advance their cause. Um, and then Jeff also says that play can be one of the things, like if you're thinking of um, of like getting out the vote or sending cards, right? Sending cards to encourage people to vote. Um, and Asha, my friend Asha does this as well. You have a, like a party where everybody's filling things out. You do some, some element of play in part of what you're doing because it helps people have fun, but also helps them be seen and it, it, it fosters connection and community. And there's all these other ways that that can help you in your activism as well. That was a long yeah. answer. Sorry about that. No, no, <laughs> um, Darcy in the chat says, I educate incarcerated adult males. I remind them about including joy and fun into their days. So yeah, um, boy, that's, so I bet that's a you. trick. Thank you, that's Darcy, amazing. for doing yeah. that. Um, I wanted to read this, um, this quote from the book, Asha, your friend Asha, yeah. um, she talks about kindness um, mm. in activism. And she says, um, being kind is a political statement to, to actively reject the where right you're wrong, where righteous your criminals, where patriotic your unpatriotic construct, and just not falling for it. So yeah. um, you talk about that, um, the kindness and, and how kindness is a form of activism. Yeah. So, and that was, um, that was a revelation for me, actually, because Asha is one of my closest friends. Um, when I think of like my inner circle, Asha is in that and she is unfailingly kind. She's probably the kindest person I've ever met. And she, I asked her basically because of course it was 2020 as well. And things were like this. It was also an election year. Like everybody was fighting and arguing and and she never, ever, ever, even in the even in the privacy, she's a political activist, by the way, and and she was activated actually as a result of the Trump election, right? She was like, okay, that's it, I'm going to be an activist. And I never, even though she's very, very Democrat, loudly Democrat, loudly a liberal, I had never ever heard her say an unkind word about Republicans or Trump or anything. So like she just didn't do it, right? She would certainly say somebody needs to be held accountable. She would certainly say that this is unacceptable, but she would never be mean or say or call names or do anything in a time when it was, let's face it, quite fashionable to call people names, right? And I asked her about that. I'm like, how do you do that? And I really sort of expected her to say, 
well, I was just raised that way, right? Like I, you know, what raised that way to be kind. That's what you should be. Um, and what was really funny is I almost found, saw a little bit of, of um, righteous fury in her when she talked about about kindness. And she said, I'm not doing it. She goes, they, that's what they want us to do. They want us to be at this. And the truth is that we are all interconnected. We're on this planet together. And, and if, if my goal is to have somebody like change their mind about an issue, my calling them names or being unkind is the last that like, why would I do that? That's not, that's not going to do anything, right? What I want to do. And she said, I see activism as an invitation. And I want to invite people to say, come sit on my front porch and let's talk about this. I wanna hear more. And she even said that my goal is not in any given interaction to change somebody's mind, right? She says, my goal is for them to walk away and go, huh, I hadn't thought of it that way. And even if they had decided that they were still right, that there is something to be won in them just going, I hadn't considered that. And that for her was the most powerful thing to do. And I, it was such a revelation. I thought, imagine if we all did that, right? If we all were like, let's talk. And you may walk away still disagreeing with each other, but maybe somebody has thought, hmm, yeah, I, 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 I get where they're coming from. I don't agree with it, but at least I get where they're coming from. And that is hard. Let me just say that is, I'm, that is, I mean, this, that's very Pollyanna sounding. Um, somehow Asha is, made, is um, able to do it. It's certainly something I struggle with, but it is something that I aspire to as well. And I think if we all aspire to that, that, that would just make the world better. Yeah, and, and um, it's resonating in the chat. Um, mm. Rhonda saying Priya Parker has had shared the foundation of a sustained dialogue is listening long enough to be changed by what you hear. Mm. Sometimes people might not be changed or it's it's like <laughs> responding to the, the impulse to yell at other drivers by accurately naming. Okay, pulling out in front of me was inconvenient and I really wish you hadn't done that. So maybe that's yeah. a practice. Maybe that's a practice I can work on is not yelling at people when they pull out in front of me. Yeah, I don't um, know if I could do that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's just um, be really, let me be really frank. But yes, I mean, I think that um, Asha is, is, ma is masterful at it. And it is certainly a, a yeah. skill I wish I could cultivate and hope to cultivate for sure. Yeah, we're going to talk about the light makers manual in the back of the book in just a second, but I wanted to get to the um, idea of gratitude. And mm. um, I have a friend, I mean, and it's something that people have been doing for a while now, writing down there's gratitude journals and mm -hmm. um, just being thankful for, for things. Um, I have a friend who does it in the mornings rather than the evenings, but okay. can you can you explain why gratitude is important in the light makers being a light maker? Yeah. So gratitude is great because let's just, there's a couple of reasons that I can think of. So I have had a pretty sustained gratitude practice um, since I was in my twenties and I am not anywhere near my twenties right now. I'm in my mid fifties right now. So um, for almost 30 years, I've been sort of very, very mindful of closing my day out by thinking about what good happened in that day. So here's a couple of reasons why it's important, I think. One, I have found my own gratitude practice to help me build resiliency when things are difficult. So for example, like I told you, I, I, um, I've been doing this since I was about 28 years old. I've come up with one good thing and sometimes it's a big thing and sometimes it's a tiny thing, but I do it. Every the reason that I was so grateful for having a gratitude practice became very clear in 2017 when we lost our home and to we um her, we're in Houston and Hurricane Harvey um destroyed our home and so we had we lost everything in our home uh luckily we were safe my my husband and daughter and our dog uh were all safe but we lost everything and because I had already had a practice of thinking about what good happened today that was arguably the most difficult and challenging time that we had as a family um and I never once couldn't come up with one good thing that happened every day. And it really helped me through that difficult time. Um, so I think gratitude helps build resiliency. So it's my, um, more than a Pollyanna thing. I, I, you know, I'm not a person that thinks, oh, well, gratitude will 
um, pull you out of depression. It certainly helped. The reason I started it was because I was going through some mild depression in my 20s. Um, and it certainly helped me in that case, but it's much more about the resiliency that it can help build. Um, it's easy to come up with in the good times. And if you have a practice, you will find it actually easy to come up in bad times. So that's one thing. The second thing is, and I link this pretty tightly in the book, I think gratitude and celebration are important when we're activists, because sometimes it can, we blind ourselves to when we have had progress, right? Um, we think, oh yeah, okay, we the bill was passed, but there's still so much work to do. Or yeah, our person was elected, but, you know, now we, the hard work begins kind of thing. And being able to stop and say, we did this, like, this is great. We made this kind of progress is another way that we start to build longevity in the work. We start to build that, that pause of, okay, we've made progress. We can see the progress that's happening. And I think that's really important as well. So I think that's for two reasons. It helps build resiliency. And again, we don't get into activism because things are great. And so we need that, but also it can help mark the progress for us as well. Great, great. Um, so in the back of the book, there is yeah. the, light, the Light Makers Manual, which is um, which gives everyone a chance to kind of put down some of their ideas and some of their daily intentions. So can you go through, and I would love if people in the chat could put could maybe put some of share some of their intentions or you were talking about light words their light words yeah. and how you how you find your light word yeah so um so in the book see i've got the book here like right to hang on a second i'm going to show you uh this much of the book this much of the book is book and then this part here is an actual sort of manual to help you embed some of the learnings and teachings of the book. And that it is primarily in journal prompts, right? So you're, you're, it, there are questions um, to sit and muse that allow you to kind of do a bit of an inventory of your talents and your gifts, right? Um, so one of the things, and one of the things that, that Natalia was just referring to, I talk about being very clear about your light words. What are the things that really sort of light you up? And the way you do that is you start to take inventory of some of the things that you love to do, um, the things that uh, you would do, even if you didn't get paid, the things you would do where doing them is the pay in itself. So for example, I've mentioned photography is one of my things that I love to do. Um, I, I love to sing. I didn't say I was good at it, but I do love to sing. Um, and it is where I find a lot of joy. So um, if you want, if you could in the chat, what I would love to do, and I will actually, I, I don't look at the chat when I'm speaking, but I'm going to look at it right now. Um, if you could share some of the things that you do in your life that you love to do, don't think of it necessarily about whether or not it's helpful for activism. You'll do that later after we leave here, but just what are the things that you do that you love to do? If you love to cook, you love to read, whatever it is. Oh, let's see. Read novels. Yes, sir. Um, oh, look at that. Listen, reading, writing. What good people you are. Nature, for sure. Sing. Another singer. Be in the ocean. Who said that? Was that a Trini? I mean, me too, for sure. Hiking. Oh, somebody's already got their light words. Forgiveness, love. For, oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Natalie. My, my girl, my Trini girl. Girlfriend said that. That's great. Um, water, we knitting. Absolutely. Growing food and cooking, that's awesome. See, I love this. And and as you go through these sort of things, this is great, read journal, highlight, stand in the ocean, watching diamonds on the sea. I've never heard of it called that way, I love that. Um, jigsaw puzzles, Susan, Norma, I agree with you. My husband and daughter never do jigsaw puzzles with me and I love doing jigsaw puzzles. Um, as you look through some of these, you can probably already kind of see hints of how these could possibly be of service to other people. Um, somebody else loves jigsaw puzzles. I see a jigsaw puzzle party unfolding right here, right now. <laughs> um, Taro, I love that. Oh, Becky, of course, of Democracy Sexy. She's amazing, guys. Give her a follow. She does some really, really good political work. Um, thank you for coming, Becky. Right, bite. Thank you. These are amazing. So yeah, so the, the exercise that um, requires you to sit down and actually make a list of everything that you do that you love to do and just make a like 
a list. I, I probably took me half an hour to do mine with a glass of wine. And I just sat and made all of my, a full list of everything. And what, for me, what emerged was that things like, you know, like singing and reading to my daughter and um, doing all of these things that had to do with expression. And you start to see sort of patterns emerge when you make this list and see this whole list in front of you of, oh, that's what I love to do. Um, taking photographs, putting Elmer's glue on my hand and peeling it off, um, all had to do with like looking at details, right? And that was something that was really, really important to me um, and, and looking at beauty in details. So you will find if you do the exercise in the book, um, it takes a while, like don't rush yourself. You may wanna start making your list go away, come back the next day and, and keep doing it that there are certain things that you're like, oh, that's really what's at the root of why I enjoy this. And that starts to um, point you in the direction of your light works and how they can be, how they can serve. So that's one of the things in the manual. Um, there was another one I think we talked about with intentions. Um, I, Natalia, I don't know if you, yeah. if we have the time to, to do that one or not, but. Yeah, we have like five to six minutes and okay. um, and I still want you to read the, the manifesto. So right. I wanna make well, sure I, we have time for that, but. That um, I won't, we won't do this exercise, but I will, I will um, say this because I think it's, um, so first of all, journaling is huge for me. I, I am a, a big journaler. Um, I have, my journal is never too far. I've got my, my, actually my journal is right here. So it's never far, very far away from me. Um, and I use my journal as a tool. It's not something where I'm like, dear diary that much, you know, it's, it's a very, um, it's a scratch pad. It's a place to keep things that I find. It's a, it's a place where I doodle. Um, and one of the things that I invite people to do if they're interested in starting a journaling practice, particularly if they're looking for how they can serve as an activist, is to start with a practice of maybe, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks of asking yourselves three questions every morning. The first question is, how can I feel healthy today? And you answer it however you wanna answer it, whether or not it's a hard workout at the gym or drinking extra water, which was on my list today. Um, the second question is, how can I feel connected today? Who can I reach out to and just say hi? Who can I thank? Um, even if it's just an email or a text. And then the final one is how can I feel purposeful today? And don't overthink that. It can be everything from giving money to an organization to dropping some stuff off at um, Goodwill to um, signing up to be a volunteer. It can be anything. But having a practice of asking yourself those three intention questions every day sometimes reveals a little bit about what your cause may end up being. So I invite you to do that, but we won't do it today. So, uh, yeah, yeah, and um, I took actually one of your journaling classes. Um, you did an online thing, and your journaling is beautiful. Yes. So oh, that's thank just you. that's another that's another topic. <laughs> <For> another <laughs> that's, a, that's another day. Yes, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you have a manifesto. Um, the book is called The Lightmaker's Manifesto, and you have the Lightmaker's Manifesto in the back of the book. Yep. And I was wondering if you could go ahead and just read it to us today, because. Um, Absolutely. I think it's very, very inspirational and um, so thank honest. you. And this and this manifesto, I will say the manifesto that uh, that I wrote here was sort of something that encompasses all of the different topics that are covered in the book. And it's a way to get you started. But I hope that if you read the book that you are inspired to come up with your own manifesto, but this will get you started. So the Lightmakers Manifesto. I believe we are interconnected. I believe peace is the true way for change. I listen. I honor my own inner wisdom. I name my gifts, those which I hold in trusteeship, knowing they are my superpowers. My different is beautiful. My privileges afford me the power to help those who are powerless. When I fall, I rise, moving through any doubt I have in my abilities because I have evidence to suggest otherwise. I am self-compassionate. I love fiercely and I refuse to succumb to hate, acrimony or fury. I believe joy, kindness, and celebration are acts of resistance. I dream of a better world and aspire to join in the march toward its attainment. I blaze with courage and conviction. I am called to action. I am a light maker. I love that. I blaze towards courage and conviction. I, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's beautiful. I love it. Um, Thank you. 
Uh, this has been fantastic. I, can you share with us uh, the where we can find you on the internet, um, where everyone yes. can find you? Yes. So my Trini friends that are already on here will tell you that Chukalunks, which looks like a long involved world, um, word, is actually a word that we use in Trinidad that means sweetheart or darling. Um, especially for children. So you can say, oh, she's such a chocolunks. Um, so you can find me anywhere you find chocolunks. If that's too difficult, then just look up karenwalrim.com. That will take you to chocolunks.com and all the different Instagrams and Twitters and everything else out there for sure. So, um, and before you go, I want to do a lightning round. Okay. Oh, yes, so, of course. Yes. All right. So can I see go. you? I can't see you right now. Can I see you? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So, yes. Karen. What would you tell your 25 year old self? Oh my goodness, that poor girl. Um, I would tell my 25 year old self um, that at some point you are gonna figure out that what other people expect of you is less important than what you expect of yourself. Um, so if you could get to do that sooner rather than later, that would be great. That's what I'd say, yeah. Okay, um, I, know, I know COVID might have restricted this a bit, but what's the most spontaneous thing you've done lately? Uh, well, I the most spontaneous thing this is so boring you guys are going to be so unimpressed with this um i made my husband buy me a rowing machine for christmas and so i have taken up rowing in my bedroom almost every morning now that's my thing that's awesome <laughs> i love rowing um what are you reading right now well i'm i'm working on another book so i am uh i am reading a lot of research for that but um I have recently read, I have read this book. I brought it just unbound by Tarana, my friend Tarana Book, who's in Burke, who's in, the, in my book. It's an amazing memoir. And then also this morning on Twitter, I was reading about the banned books that are happening in schools and that made me really angry. Um, and so I said, I asked people to share their favorite banned books with me and I was gonna start reading them. And the first one somebody shared that I realized I'd never read before, um, but I'd seen the movie I downloaded is The Color Purple. So I will be starting okay. The couple Color Purple this weekend, um, yeah. for sure. <laughs> That's great. As an act of resist, um, activism, act of activism. Yes, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is your favorite place in the world and why? Well, I mean, Trinidad is gonna be my favorite place in the world. It's the place I feel most at home for sure. Um, so that's one, but uh, for my 50th birthday, we went to St. Martin, also in the Caribbean. And that was, it actually, St. Martin reminded me of the, the Mayaro. I grew up in a small village in Mayaro in, uh, in Trinidad. And St. Martin reminded me of the Mayaro of my childhood. So that would be a very close second as well. I like it. And then finally, what woman do you admire and why? Ah, oh, I told you yesterday that this was really, really <laughs> so, difficult for so me. Many. Yeah. Yes, but I think I land on, um, actually right now would be my daughter. She's gonna be 18. So I, maybe woman is, is strong until six weeks from now. She'll be 18 in six weeks. So, um, but she is in her last year of school. She's looking at universities. She's got this amazing outlook at, um, with this idea of exploration and experimentation, which is sort of what I want to bring into my own life. So right now she's, she's definitely, Alexis is definitely the person that I'm admiring the most lately. Well, that, yeah, that's wonderful. I, I love that actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As the mom of two daughters, yeah, I, I can yeah. totally understand that. Um, so thank you so much. We do have, um, just hang on a second, Karen. <laughs> um, we do have a couple of um, upcoming events. Mm.